G'day legend, frother, fellow frother, shaft throwing, breath holding legend. It's great to have you with me. I am Shrek and this is the New Spirit Podcast. Today it's a second interview with Eckhart Benkenstein. Back in the day we did uh, a massive episode on how to catch lobster. If you're interested in that, head back and do that. It's episode 81. So it's been a little while. It's uh, diving for crayfish. We called him the the bane of lobster, Benkenstein. So um, check it out. Um, anyway, Eckhart's back with me today. We're chatting hunting southern bluefin tuna. And more importantly, what to do with them after you get them back in the boat. Because tuna sort of force you to up your game with the way you care for your catch. So let me just say that briefly. Um, but we, we get into dive watch recommendations. We talk about what gear he's rocking these days, his um, go-to for people in the Melbourne area, uh, as well as a bunch of his upcoming retreats. Eckhart is a certified frother, but also a paddy freediving instructor, and he loves to go spearfishing and teach people freediving and spearfishing. He's got a couple of retreats. We chat about them. There's Whit Sundays, Killsby, which I've been on, and an African spearfishing safari slash spearfishing trip and it's a special one because that's his uh, motherland and um yeah and him and i are also going to run a course uh next year well maybe not a course or maybe a course and a trip but it's going to be more of a spearfishing focus so if you're interested in that there's uh more info in this episode hey longer intro today i have recently become a father again on the 31st of may uh elijah finn daly was born into my wife and i's life uh he's our fourth child our our, our fourth son, uh, our first one together, but uh, life is definitely taking a pace change, but we are really enjoying it. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of a change happening in the Noobs Bureau world. Um, I want to talk with some of the legends getting around our community, though. So I got a couple of voice messages here, one from Conrad and one from Jackson. Uh, Jackson is at snappy underscore jacks on Instagram, uh, and he loves shopping at Neptune Spear and Dive up in Mackay. Uh, go and get a copy of 99 Spear Recipes there from Caitlin and her team. Uh, but hey, let's have a listen, Conrad, and then Jackson. Hey, g'day, Nubas. Uh, my name's Conrad. I'm from out, live out northwest Sydney. Been a patron for a few months. Helping to put fuel in the Noob Spear outboard, eh? Trying to. Been <laughs> for a while. Every I bit. listened to quite a few episodes before I oh, no. finally forced out the money. Did I guilt you into it, did I? You yeah, <laughs> did. <laughs> Got too cheap. <laughs> so, Conrad, we were, we were chatting before and you were telling me, like, you like to head down to Jervis Bay and you're getting your young fella in the water. He's nine. And um, also Seal Rocks. You're trying to find some sort of sheltered spots and um, get him get him moving around. What what sort of gun are you using or is he using? Okay, I got him a little 70-centimeter uh, uh, Rob Allen. Yeah. Oh, um, nice. When I, actually, when I bought it, I actually – Bought one of the cheaper guns and um, had it in the car. Paid for it and everything. It was up at the store in Brisbane. Yeah, right. And then um, and, and I thought, because I didn't want to spend too much on his birthday. It was his ninth birthday, and then uh, I ended up just going straight back in and swapped it and upgraded it to the Royal Balance just so it's better quality. Um, and yeah, he's been nailing little, you know, red mowy, uh, a couple of whiting. Oh, beautiful. Um, but I've never loaded a gun so often until I got him into it. Um, <laughs> I, had to, <laughs> um, I had to make a, make a rule, too, that he wasn't allowed to shoot unless he dove down, which a mate in New Zealand told me that's one thing he does with his son. Otherwise, you just end up, you know, you're loading it like 20, 30 times in a row because he takes a few shots to actually finally get something. Yeah. But, yeah, it's pretty cool. I see all rocks is awesome. You get a lot of... Um, there's all sorts of fish through there. Um, one of the last dives we did, he, he got onto a big school of mullet. Yeah, which, right. Eh? So it was pretty cool watching him, you know, chase around a school of mullet. It, it looked like he was chasing around Pelagia. Yeah. Because cool. <laughs> he's only a little fellow um, with a, with a smallest beer gun. Have you, have you thought yeah. about chucking like, um, 12 mil bands on it so he can load it himself? Yeah, I could do that. I mean, he's nowhere near loading it at the moment. Yeah, right. I've given him a, made him try, but um, yeah, he, he'll get there. He's pretty determined. Yeah. He'd love to be able to load it himself. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I oh, mean, that's cool. It's pretty rewarding, eh, watching your, your young ones into it. 
I've had the same sort of oh, pleasure. Oh, the best. Yeah. yeah, absolute best. We had a cool um, run-in with a big grey nerd shark up there too, which he actually just loved. That that hung around us for a, for a fair while. And, uh, you know, they're harmless. But when you see them in the water, fish or a jack. And he was, when we got out of the water, he was just so pumped. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's telling, telling his sister and, you know, a wife and pretty much everyone he met for the next week or so. Grinning from ear to ear, and I think that's how we yeah. all ca- we catch the bug. Sounds like frother. he's, he's yeah. got it. He's a frother now. Yeah, he's definitely got it. And you're a Spiro dad too, so that's pretty cool. Need um, one of those t-shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Noobspiro.com, bro. I'll get you a discount code <laughs> since you're a patron. There you go. <laughs> I'll sort you out in a minute, actually. Um, but yeah, awesome to catch up, Conrad. Thanks for putting fuel in the Noob Spiro outboard and. Um, yeah, man. Cheers for the call. Out. It's weird hearing you through the speakers and actually being able to talk back to you for a change. <laughs> hey, Shrek. What's up, you bloody legend? Hey, mate, I wanted to take five and give Neptunes in Mackay a shout-out. Stocking the 99 Spiro's recipe. Just went and picked up a copy, mate, and I'm keen to put some of these awesome recipes to the test. Hideaway right Bay, a couple of weeks. Hopefully we got some good fish and we got uh, can put some of these recipes to the test. Mate, awesome work with the podcast. Love it. Listen to it religiously. For newbies like myself, learn so much. So, dude, thank you very much. Thank you for everything you bring to the sport. And hoorah! Awesome voice message there from uh, Conrad and then Jackson. As I mentioned, go up to Neptune Spear and Dive in Mackay there and get a copy of 99 Spear Recipes if you haven't got one already. It's in now in 25 different stores. I'm going to give them to you in just a sec. Um, longer intro today, guys. Sorry. Hey, Palapas Ventana have got their Blue Water World Cup. This is probably one of the most fun spearfishing competitions in the world in an epic, epic location. I... If, I've been wanting to do this trip for years. Um, let's put it that way. And um, it's eighteen ninety nine per diver. Uh, the comp runs from July first to fifth. There's three competition days. The skippers have competitions with each other to put their divers on the winning fish. Uh, there's prize money. There's wicked prizes. It's a fantastic location. Can't recommend it highly enough. Check it out. The Palapas Blue Water World Cup. Pump that into Google. Go and find it. Register. Get involved. Get amongst it. Um, in other news, the Jobfish Tribute is launching. I have got 80 shirts and hoodies and a bunch of stickers rocking up on my doorstep in the next day or two. There'll be photos up. Get in there. Get amongst it. It's the first time I've really tried to carry a lot of stock at home. My wife's shipping out the orders. Um, but it's a this whole Jobfish Tribute is an homage to them as a species. They're iconic in our world. They they demand the very best from every diver that hunts them, and that's uh, where the concept come from. So check that out. Go to noobspiro.com if you want to get in and get some merch. Um, also, jump on our socials and check out the different styles and stuff if you like. Hey, um, Nine Pin Wetsuits are having a, a run-out sale. Uh, ninepin.com.au. Go and get ninepinwetsuits.com.au. Sorry. Go and get yourself um, a three-mil hood for under 250 bucks. Um, seriously good deal. Uh, five mils for under 250 bucks as well. You cannot beat that. Uh, six suits and um, a bit of a run-out sale going there at the moment. Um, last but certainly not least, retailers carrying the Noob Spiro books. I have brought on a bunch more. I'm just going to tell you about them, not the whole list. Um, Ocean Hunter in New Zealand, Whangarei, Wellington, Auckland, all carrying 99 Spiro recipes. Thank you very much to the legends that have helped me get that in there. Also, Type of Tackle up in Northland have got them as well. That's the four sort of locations you can get them easily in New Zealand. Hunt, Gather, Grow in Bedella, New South Wales came on board. Barbecues and more in Browns Plains and Mo Tackle in Coffs Harbour. Get in there. Rob and his team have got them aboard at Mo Tackle in Coffs Harbour. If you also want to get them, Thwaites Marine. Can't go past Ben and the legends down there at Thwaites, Thwaites Marine. If you're in that part of the world, go get your boat done there too. Hey, ma- <laughs> massive intro. I've gone I've riffed way too long. I know. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm excited. My world has changed. Hey, let's get into it. Eckhart Benkenstein, Southern Bluefin Tuna, and a whole bunch more. Here we go. Shop for your spearfishing gear at adreno.com.au in store and online. You can use the code NoobSpiro to save 20 bucks on any purchase over $200. Why would you shop with Adreno? I hear you say, well, <clears throat> let me lay it out. Flat rate shipping. $9.99 on all orders. Hassle free returns policy. Australia, 
price match guarantee. Shop now, pay later with Afterpay. Fully sick brands, huge, obnoxiously ginormous range of great spearfishing gear made just for legends like you. Go Adreno, go Pro, don't be slow. Shop massive spearing gear at Adreno. I'll stop Shrek, that's a no, no. But seriously, shop with the Noob Spiro's longest running partner, Adreno. Head to adreno.com.au online or in store, they're huge mega stores. Use the code Noob Spiro to save 20 bucks on any purchase over $200. Buying gear online can be tricky. You ask yourself the same questions. Will it arrive on time? Is it actually what I want? How much is a shipping going to cost? Great news, the name you can trust is Neptonix. Neptonics have route package protection, basically insurance on your gear so you can have peace of mind. Free shipping to the lower 48 when you spend $199 or more. Clear, transparent communication on shipping time and most gear ships in two days. They also have my favorite a no BS returns policy. That's right, no BS. And it's all backed by one of the strongest names in spearfishing. And it finishes with tonics. And it's not gin and tonic, it's Neptonics. Solid gear that works. Visit Neptonics, buy tough gear. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. That's right, use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10, to save 10% on your order at neptonics.com. Uh, good day, guys. Today I am uh, joined by a South African spearfishing legend. His name is uh, Eckhart Benki Benki Poo Benkenstein. He's from Salt Sessions, now operating out of uh, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Eckhart Lekka, join me, my brother. Thank you very much. Shrek, yeah, it's uh, great, great to talk to you again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bro. I do yeah. this to you every yeah. time we catch up. Nah, it's all good. It's all good. I'm sure, like uh, every time you, you like, we have a phone call because we call each other pretty often. There's like, I can just see you wincing on your end. <laughs> how bad my consistent jokes and accent are. No, mate. You actually, uh, you actually get, uh, you get pretty close. You get pretty, pl- pretty close. I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite call it. Uh, what's that? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Blood Diamond. I've, but, just, um, I've got a du- better than that at least. I've got to Dutch out my name a bit. Uh, my name is uh, uh, oh no, hang on. I'm from <laughs> I'm from Pretoria, and my name is Isaacius uh, Isaac <laughs> Isaacius Stalinbosch. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's it's awesome, bro. Like you've you've definitely had your South African roots, but now you're firmly enmeshed in Australian culture, and definitely that that Melbourne area. You just. Uh, you're educating an entire generation of Spiros that are coming through. Yeah. So actually, um, literally this week was our nine year anniversary of moving to, to Australia, which is, I, I literally can't believe how quickly it's gone. Um, so yeah, time flies. Hey. Yeah. Um, and yeah, been, been teaching here in Melbourne for the last just over seven years. I think it is. Yeah. Um, well, it's hard to keep track actually, yeah. but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been really good. It's been really, really good. You got your system dialed in down there too. I really like your operation and, and how you roll. I've come and done courses with you too. So like, um, I mean, we did the Killsby retreat, me, you and Adam. And, uh, yeah. you know, um, and it was such a good time. You guys have got a, you just got an amazing thing there put together. It's like you've done that. You've worked it several times too now. So your systems are dialed yeah. in and everyone's having an, if you're not having a good time there, I've got to tell you, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Look, I mean, you kind of, uh, you might not even realize this. It's uh, that that retreat at Killsby is Australia's longest running free dive retreat. Oh wow! Uh, we've been running it just over five years, and every time we run it, we change it and we tweak it and we work on it. You know, and initially, it was like a two and a half day retreat, and you know, after a few of those, we realized this is right. There's just too there's too much to do. And to pack it into two and a half days, so we've lengthened it, lengthened it, and even now it's we've changed it now to like a four night um, retreat. Oh, so wow. it's changed again over the last about year and a half or so um, since you've been actually. So uh, we've got a little bit more space and time, and there's a bit more opportunity for people to obviously. I, I'm a massive advocate of of exploring 
kind of the Australian coastline. And, and South Australia is, is something that's largely untouched. Like, there's so much to explore there. So I love giving people the opportunity and space to be like, okay, well, you know, go for it. Go go dive, you know, Ewan's ponds or pick in any ponds or go explore the coastline. Like there's so much to see in that area. And like you said, yeah. you know, if you're not having fun, um, yeah, I, I don't know what you're doing or you might not be present or something, but yeah, it's yeah. it's just such a good time for people. Oh, we cooked up some fat seafood on that too. Like, and, and you often bring like Southern bluefin tuna and you and me are going to chat about that in a minute. But if people yeah, want to, if, if people want to see what the experience is like, I spent like four days editing a video of my experience down there. I took my good mate Cam and we had an absolute blast. If people go to noobspiro.com forward slash SBT, because we're going to talk about Southern bluefin tuna a lot in this, um, in this interview. Um, I'm going to link up that video so people can go and have a look at the Killsby retreat and uh, uh, it's longer now and even better. So um, that, that'd that be cool for people to do. Um, mate, Salt Sessions, strength to strength. You're dominating the Melbourne scene. You're running you're running some kick-ass retreats. We're going to get to that in a little while. Let's chat about hunting Southern bluefin tuna because I, I, I've chatted with James a fair bit about it in the past, but I, I want to revisit it. I think one thing we um, yeah. we didn't get to spend a lot of time on was the journey from ocean to plate. And uh, you yep. guys, you guys have spent years now dialing them in. That fishery yep. is like a, it's a fisheries management wet dream. Like they, you know, like that that fish is returned in in mass, and their numbers in mass. That's their, correct. Their numbers are up. I, I saw you shot like a hundred and forty four kg one. So um, yeah, it, I reckon it's a good it's a good topic to get into. I th- I think I mean on that it, it's one of the fisheries. Like overall, you can probably look at the historic uh, southern bluefin tuna fishery and go, you know, it was pretty bad. Um, you know, they were heavily targeted by commercial uh, fisheries um, oh, in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, but then they started obviously dialing it back and the quota systems coming into place. And it's, it's such a unique species because it really travels – uh, in, in such a large extent around the coastline of, of Australia. Um, and where now, you know, we, we're we seeing fish ranging from, I was out literally this week, you know, we were seeing fish in the like six to eight kilo range, which is really small. Um, and, you know, if you're traveling down to Portland um, or uh, further south, um, you know, there are people catching barrels, you know, 120 kilo, 130 kilo fish. So there's, there's such a massive range and diverse range of fish at the moment. And there's, there's definitely different seasons. So we've got our, like, we've got our summer season, then we've got our, a more winter, uh, season when they, when they really actively start feeding. So okay. it's, it's a fishery that's, that's really come up, I'd say over the last six years, seven years. Now, the interesting thing is, I, th- I think there's been a, a bit of a research or like, I don't know if, if, if we as spear fishermen have just recently found them again. Yeah. Because a lot of spearos in Victoria haven't had access to boats. Um, so there's, there's, there's been a few more people buying boats, you know, over the last couple of years. And so there's more people exploring the coastline mm. um, and possibly, you know, diving um, and targeting fish that, that um, like our summer fish, most most uh, fishermen that are line fishing are unable to catch them. Like if they don't if they don't hook them by eight o'clock in the morning, from eight o'clock onwards they kind of they don't really feed. I mean they don't feed well uh, already during summer, but from eight onwards they 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 really don't eat, feed well. Okay. And um, um, so maybe those fish were there all along, and we we're blissfully unaware. I mean, there's, there's some interesting conversations to be had around that, or it's, you know, uh, a fishery that's, that's now bounding back in, in its population. The the interesting thing on this, on their population and their health actually is, you know, the, um, I did a little bit of looking into what, how big a sexually mature, like bluefin tuna is. Yeah. Um, because you know how most so, so bluefin tuna don't have a minimum size, uh, and most fishery fisheries when they when they set the minimum size on a species, it's to give that that fish at least one or two breeding cycles before mm. you're able to harvest them. 
Now, with Bluefin uh, not having a minimum size, we've got to be conscious of of that. Um, and I think the sexual mature age of a fish, I think they had it in, in, in measurements. So it was uh, like 130 centimeters. It, it, it's going to be a big fish. It, it'll yeah. be probably like a 50, 60 kilo fish. So oh, wow. most of us, most of our summer fish that we are catching here, um, uh, you know, according to uh, the, the, the fisheries report that I was reading, um, aren't uh, sexually mature. Mm. Um, although we were seeing behavior which looked like spawning behavior this um, this last season, but I mean, uh, you know, who, who am I to kind of say what that looks like and what it is? Um, but you know, according to the research, it's it's really the the older fish that are uh, more sexually mature. So, you know, anything from fifty, sixty kilos and and heavier, um, that's sexually mature. Oh, okay. So, so, have you got any idea on growth rates and stuff like that? Man, uh, I could possibly just look it up now. I, I was trying to. They grow really fast, mm. um, and they, I think they they've got a lifespan of around forty years. Um, it, it's 40 saying to fifty years. Google's telling me that um, that the eggs are estimated to hatch within two to three days, and over the next two years, attain sizes of approximately fifteen kilograms. So. Based on that sort of estimated growth rate, uh, it's saying, uh, okay, so so it, it could possibly take three to four years to reach sexual maturity based on that projected growth curve. Is that kind I of think, what you're thinking? Yeah, I, th- I think you're. Cl- I, th- I oh. think I read somewhere it was was six to eight years, but oh no, it's um, saying it's saying eight to twelve here, eight to okay, twelve years 12, old. Yeah, yeah, and they have a yeah. lifespan of twenty to forty years. So. Um, yeah. uh, so a huge fish like that, like 144 kilo, it, it's probably nearing the edge of its lifespan. Yeah. It's in its yeah. absolute prime. So I think, you know, but the the bigger the fish, like in that like 140, I haven't heard much bigger than 170 kilos. Like I think the linos have caught something closer to that. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's definitely at the, the top end of the scale, like at the top end of the scale um, in terms of, like ultimate size. So it's a kind of fish that, um, you know, we were allowed to um, harvest two of them per day per person. Mm-hmm. You, there's also a, a total allowable catch. So you're not allowed to possess more than a hundred and I think it's 160 kilos. So again, it's something that you, we've got to be wise about. It's not like every time I go out, I'm shooting two every time. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, there's definitely when you're starting out, there's a bit of a, um, a, a fever that, that that comes about. Yeah, um, but yeah. as as you kind of uh, grow and mature in your kind of your spearfishing journey, there's definitely you start be becoming more aware of uh, species and being more aware of the ocean and your impact on the ocean. So um, it's it's a good thing to to look after the fish that you do catch uh, and respect it in that way. And that's I think something we're going to touch on now in terms of. Once once you get your fish, how do we how, how do we get it from from the ocean yeah. to your home to your front door basically? I was reading a document while we we're chatting, and it's saying the the threats are, are um, the fact that they reach sexual maturity at a late age and have a, a relatively slow growth rate after that. Um, so it makes them hard to renew their numbers. So you've sort of touched on one of the primary concerns, which is you know if they aren't reaching maturity till they're fifty or sixty kilos, then taking animals when they are smaller size, you've just got to do it wisely. Um, like if you're yeah. in a school of, you know, 200 fish or something and you haven't shot one, you might you, you might take a 20 kilo fish, but you're probably not going to go out and do that every week because you, you're, you, you're, you're practicing a form of fishing that over a long term or a long period of time is not actually sustainable because you're not allowing them to reach sexual maturity. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So those fish, there's obviously bigger fish um, – that are being caught further south, so more Portland, like uh, and around to South Australia side. Mm. Uh, but also, what happens is is a lot of the fish migrate up the coast. So the fish now that that we get off Melbourne, generally in our summer months, are smaller fish. So they they range between, I mean, I saw six to eight kilo or ten kilo fish this week. But normally it's a little bit bigger. So normally it's about like fifteen to about thirty kilos mm. that we get off Melbourne. But then they start moving up the coast towards the, the Sydney side, and you'll often hear um, the people up uh, New South Wales, where if, if they're catching bluefin tuna, they're in the 40, 50, 60 
uh, 70 kilo class fish. So they, as they move up the coast, they're obviously getting bigger and, and, and bulking up as, as they're feeding. Yeah, right. Yeah. Very interesting. All right. So the other thing I noticed with, with tuna, like, because like you said, like Melbourne Sparrows have, like South Australian Sparrows, I think have been spearing Southern Bluefin tuna for a bit longer, but the Melbourne mm. crew kind of got onto it only really recently in the last sort of, you know, like you said, sort of five or six years for the most part. Learning yeah. how to care for a tuna is a bit different than learning how to care for a kingy or, you know, um, some of your dusky moorwong and other illustrious uh, Melbourne species. <laughs> illustrious fish. Yeah. Got to watch out for them. Talk to us about, you know, so you shoot a southern bluefin tuna, right? You, I mean, we're going to talk about gear too, hopefully, so we might go backwards. Yeah. But, I mean, you shoot one, you land it. Um, what are we doing? I've got that fish in my in my arms. It's still struggling. I've got a hand in its gills, which I understand so, is quite hard to do. So, yeah, so it's a very interesting fish. It's uh, to to try and actually get your hands onto them because they, when you're fighting them, they often allow themselves to be brought up relatively easily um, and then as soon as you put your hand on the spear or touch their tail trying to grab them they will go for a blistering run um, and so they they fight really hard so um, I mean we could talk a little bit about gear because um, I've you know I've shot uh, tuna with real guns and with breakaway setups and with you know traditional setups where you've got your spear, which is attached to your shooting line, which is attached to your gun, and then your float line. Mm. Um, definitely the most preferred way is the breakaway setup. So for for those listeners that, you know, you're not sure what that means, is it means that the spear that you've got on your spear gun um, has got the shooting line, and that, that shooting line can be mono or cable in some cases or Dyneema. And then you've got your float line attached directly to your shooting line. And what that means is when you shoot that spear and it hits the fish, your float line is will follow that fish and you've got your gun in your hand. So you'll swim up and then either clip your gun onto your float or give your gun to the guy on the boat and then you can proceed in fighting the fish. Um, so it, it removes any kind, it, it removes another break in the chain. So wherever you have joints, knots, uh, clips, anything like that, that's like, that's a point of failure. Mm. Um, so the more of those points that we can remove, the better, especially when it comes to big fish. Now the advantage with bluefin is that they don't, they fight relatively clean. They, they're not like, uh, you know, doggies or kingfish that will, you know, find a rock in the middle of anywhere and wrap itself around there 20 times and then tear off. And now you're sitting with a, a shaft in the, you know, in 30, 40 meters of water. So they, they fight, they just go down uh, yep. is what you do. They, they go down pretty hard. Um, and so you've got to obviously lift them up. The one thing uh, that you need to be mindful of with tuna is line management. Um, especially if you're, if you've got, if you're using a real real gun, but even normal float line, because they go for those blistering runs, if, you, if you're bringing the line up, what you want to do is you want to keep on swimming. Um, and as you swim, the line's obviously going behind you. Now, the one thing that some, some of you might not be aware of is that tuna, towards the end of their, their fight, they start doing like these large circles. Yeah. The hard part of those circles is that you're, you're looping yourself in your own float line. Yeah. Um, and so you've got to be very careful about the possibly like that last, you know, 10, 15 percent of your fight because you're the, the fish is like it's hard for you to dictate where that fish is going because they're so powerful. So you're going to be going around in circles and there's a really good chance you're going to get wrapped up in your float line. So, you know, for, for any of you that 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 uh, look at targeting uh, bluefin tuna, that's something that you, either you need to be very mindful of or the buddy that's with you in the water can help you manage it and try and you know, help you like we I've, I've had, you know, someone on the boat, uh, you know, pulling some of the float line up and just kind of neatening it up and, and getting it ready in case it goes for another run. Mm. So there's definitely, uh, you've got to think about those kind of aspects to, to the fight so that you make it safe for yourself. Uh, the last part of that fight is obviously you want to, depending on the size of the fish, you, you can sometimes get the fish in your hands um, and just, bear hug it and, and go for the, the, the tuna rodeo, <laughs> um, which is, uh, is very entertaining to watch if you're the person on the boat. It's uh, awkward if they've got a shaft sticking through them too, though, because you get stabbed with your own shaft. And if, yeah. and if, you, if you've never done any boxing and you're not used to protecting your chin, like a, a you know, like a hundred kilo tuna smashing its face into you, into your jaw, 
It'd quite easily give you a lights out moment too, I'd imagine. Oh, it's, but it's even just a tail. It's vibrating yeah, yeah. at such a pace. So my my personal preference is when you're hunting tuna, it, it's it's really a team sport. Mm. Um, it's not an individual sport, which is which is why I couldn't claim my record um, on my fish yeah. because you know it was my first time going for barrels. I hadn't really um, tried go, like I, I'd shot smaller school fish, but I hadn't really chased barrels, and this is my first time in the water. And I'd previously I shot and lost um, an even bigger fish, which oh, is why wow. when I shot this one, I real I thought, oh, it was. It's big, but it's you know it's not record big. Um, so it, it was for for me. I, I viewed it as a team sport, and I was in the water. I, I had um, a friend of mine in the water, Aaron, who I think you might have chat, chatted yeah, to yeah. before. And you know, so he was helping me uh, with it. So it's really a team sport. It's the person on the boat that's protecting you as the divers, making sure no 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 fish uh, fisherman is going to be trawling their lines over your head, um, and you know, your buddy making sure that you're okay. If you need anything, um, you know, they can hand you a second gun or a third gun or whatever, but those bigger fish, you really want to dispatch with, with a second or third gun. And the best is to have almost like a kill gun that's dedicated for it, where you don't have a flopper on it. So if you, you shoot for the brain and if you miss, you can, you can just pull that shaft straight back out and you can reload and, and try for that, that kill shot again, because a fish mm. that size, um, I, I, I think you'd be, oh, you'd, be risking a lot to put your hands on it if 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 it wasn't um, if if you hadn't stoned it. Yeah, right. So you're taking yeah. a, a precise second shot, trying to stone yeah. the fish, and that way you're not yeah. dealing with uh, 144 kilos of aggression. Angry of angry fish. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but once you have it, uh, so those smaller fish, like you might try and grab it with your hands, and it's definitely possible. But what th- they tend to like uh, their gills. I mean, everything about a tuna is streamlined. Like you look yeah. at it and it's just designed for speed. It's got these massive muscles, this really thick tail. Uh, it's designed to move. The, the The pectoral fins fold into its body. It's got little grooves that it folds in. So it's, it's a really majestic fish. And, um, you know, everything about it is sleek. So even for you to get your hands in the gills, those gills come down so tight. It is... It's really hard to get your hands in there. And also, once your hands are in there, they've got these um, almost like grates that can really mess up your fingers a, a fair bit. But once your hands are in there, that's when you've got control. Is once you've got yeah. your hands in the gills, that's when you're going to have the best control on the fish. And um, bleeding yeah. them? So if it's hard to get access with your hand, is bleeding them still the same? Yeah, so, so bleeding them, there's a few different techniques that – that you can, um, uh, you know, for the listeners, they can uh, watch some of the stuff on um, on YouTube with what some of the fishermen do. Um, so there's a, a vein that runs just uh, down from the, the the pectoral fin down the center of the fish. It's very shallow, so you're only it's like less than a centimeter deep is the cut that you have to make, um, and so you can start bleeding it there. Um, something that I've started to do a bit more recently is when my hand, when I've got my, my hand in the gills is I'll actually take my knife and, and run it along the gills, um, and then start, uh, uh pulling out some of the gills, yeah. uh, with my hands, uh, to start it bleeding out at multiple areas so that as much of the blood can come out while, cause obviously the blood will congeal and, and, and get, uh, quite thick and it, it won't like if you try and bleed a fish that that's been on ice for like you know a couple of hours it's it's not really going to bleed well so yeah. you really want to bleed it as quickly as possible um, and spend that time once you have that fish in your hand spend that time there um, you can have a rope that's set up on the boat that you can tail wrap the fish yeah so obviously you're not you're not going to lose it um, and then you can start the 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 bleeding processing the fish so that when you get it onto the boat again there's less uh tuna blood on the boat because tuna blood is sticky and it <laughs> doesn't yeah. smell great after a couple of weeks but um you can start process- processing the fish and then uh um i'd recommend even just gutting it so that when you get it in your 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 bag with the ice that you can actually get some ice into the the stomach cavity into the gill cavity um, and really drop that temperature because when they fight, they, I mean, they're just muscle. So they, yeah. they, they heat up 
tremendously. So the quicker you can lower that temperature, the better. Yeah, yeah. What you'll see, what I've seen in some of the the big uh, kind of more commercial operations is they'll actually tail wrap the fish and drag it behind the boat, um, and 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 let that it. it bleeds it out and it cools it down uh, relatively quick. And then obviously they'll get it on a, on a bit of an ice slurry uh, as quick as they can. Got a sweet deal for you today, guys. Go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from Adam Stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines. The Freediving Manual is a digital freediving course, one that you can do at home, at your leisure, whenever you've got time. The course contains absolutely everything that a freediving instructor would teach on a freediving course. The digital courses are broken down into a video format and they contain everything that a freediving instructor would teach on a freediving course. We have beginner freediving courses, intermediate freediving courses and advanced freediving courses for those who are working on diving deeper. The freediving manual contains all the safety information that any Spiro could want. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Use the code Spiro to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code Spiro to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold, understand your body better, and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program is not for noobs, as this program is for people who have some diving under their belts and understand some basic spearfishing safety, but it's perfect for spearos who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process, and a set goal. The five minute freediver works. Get started for free and see if it's for you at howtofreedive.com. There's a tester there. Use the code NOOBSPIRO, N O O B S P E A R O, to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. Freediving for spearfishers, a fantastic way to prepare, especially if you've got a big trip coming up. Get to that five minute mark, and it does translate to your diving at howtofreedive.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Kill Shot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Kill Shot Spear Guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. A lot of people think, like with hunting big open water species like tuna, that, you know, you've got to figure out all the gear and the hunting and finding them and stuff. And then. Sometimes the thinking about, oh, how are we going to process and care for this fish sort of comes after. And it's a little bit of a shame, like, because if you've got 100 yeah. kilos of animal there, you, like, and every sparrow shares this, uh, well, okay, like 99.8% of us share the same passion for, you know, yeah. making the most of what we're bringing home. Like, if you're going to kill it, there is a, there is a cost to that, that animal's life. And we take yeah. it consciously, but we should yeah. also be 100% conscious and 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 you know respectful of making sure we use every bit of that animal and with, with, with game fishing like they've known about cooling animals down for a long long time and this is yeah. we can learn stuff from some of these other people that have been doing it for a lot longer than we have and um, yeah. i like that you you went into that so bleeding the animal thoroughly towel wrapping it from the boat gutting it and and doing as much of the bleeding as you can before you're putting that boat in the esky. Then you're stuffing the gills in the gut with ice. Uh, what are yeah. we doing next? So, well, one person can do that. The other person sorting out, you know, 30 meters of float line and <laughs> shooting line and all the tangles that's ensued from the fight. Because that, honestly, it takes... It takes a fair bit getting that organized, but uh, one person will get the will really get the fish ready and on ice. Obviously, the best is get a couple of photos before you chuck it on ice because the fish is going to look the best as it comes out of the water. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you really want to kind of respect that fish. Like I, I'm a very good example on on on. Um, you know how you're saying about how how to respect your fish. Like 
I, I've never, I, I never had a bag that was big enough for a barrel. Yeah. I never really thought that was even in my uh, wheelhouse you know, realm. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. it. So I actually only bought like one of those big cooler bags um, last month or wow. a month before because I'd like to this year um, at least get w- one more uh, big fish. Um, but what I've done, and, and maybe some of the the listeners can do that as well, is you know if you um, are going out on a boat, if and you've got your consistent crew, everybody chips in, you know, hundred bucks each or hundred and fifty bucks each, and then you've got a big fish bag for the boat. Um, it's it, not that one person has to spend that. Like I don't know what I got mine second hand, um, but yeah, um, I think they're around four. They're, they're not cheap. They're four five hundred dollars for like one of those big fish bags. Like the the really big, like it's two meters long. It's like yeah, I can yeah. climb into the thing. Um, so. But you know, if everybody chips in a couple, like a hundred bucks each, then you know, then you've got a big fish bag for the boat, and you're you're good to go. Yeah. So that's that's maybe a way that 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 some of you might be able to get something like that, or even even if it's a smaller bag for the smaller school fish, or even for you know wherever you're diving. You know, if everybody chips in a hundred bucks, you've got a, a you know a good esky or a good good fish bag uh, to to keep your fish cool, and obviously. Buy the ice before you head out there. That's uh, it's always a good idea. Although it's it's notorious. It's always the trips that you go on that I don't know if it's for your uh, shirk for yourself the same way. It's the trips where things go wrong. That's those are the trips when you end up getting fish. Like yeah, someone yeah. forgets the ice and there's an issue with the trailer and the motors giving you. That, those are the trips when things go right in terms yeah. of like results in fish. Where yeah. if if you've got the ice and everything went perfect and the launch was perfect and there's no fish, you've got all your you've got all your gear. You don't have to like <laughs> bum a snorkel or a mask from a bait. You know, then 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 everybody struggles to get fish. Hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> no, I got it. So well, I sent it down. We've bought one of these big uh, these big cooler bags because, like, I read too. Like um, these tuna grew up to two two and a half meters. Like they can be a huge animal, you know. Um, so you want to care for that. You've got it iced. We get home. What are we doing from there? Processing well, a fish so like that must be insane. T- two two issues that you might have. So obviously with barrels, uh, for those that are targeting barrels, we had an issue with my fish where we could get it. We got it onto the boat because the, the boat that we were on had like one of those dive doors. So we got it on. Um, and then we realized, first we tried to take a photo with it. And we're like, this is big because three of us couldn't lift it. We're like, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're like this uh we, we we didn't know how much it weighed but we're like this is big if three of us together couldn't lift this thing um then we got to the the boat ramp and we couldn't get it off the boat because it was too big um so we had to drive to portland because they had like the, they, they had one of those winches that could actually take the tuna off the boat like this yeah. crane and put it on a, a filleting table where you can process it if, um, if guys want to see this um this photo of this <laughs> fish because you've got a photo of it in the portland winch there um, if yeah. you go to Eckhart's Instagram, which is salt underscore sessions underscore freediving, um, yeah. there's a photo of that tuna loud and proud, and it, it's a phenomenal looking fish. Oh, it's uh, of yeah, it's it's a fish of a lifetime. Let's put it like that. Like, I, I, it's it'll be I think near impossible for me to come close to that again. It was oh, wow. one of those days where everything went right. Um, but yeah, so that's like with those big fish that. It can be like a logistical, like a real problem. Actually, just getting it off the boat. Yeah. Um, so, what can you can you portion it? Like, could you cut? Could you cut yeah, it so into thirds? A slab. Oh, but yeah, well, then you've got like a slab of tuna that you have to like somehow get off. Yeah, anyway, yeah. so we we ended up just driving to Portland. They had a winch. We winched it off, got it onto a table, and then we we fill it to the at the um, on the filler tables in the Portland Harbor there. Um, but most people will, you know, target your school fish. Uh, those things you can travel with. You, you know, take them home and uh, and process them at home. Obviously, it's it's a it's still a big fish, so it's it's hard to process inside your house. You might want to do it in the grass, um, or I've just recently, in fact, uh, like uh, uh, Shrek, I don't know what you, what you've got set up at home, but I, I've recently just bought like a secondhand um, stainless stainless bench. steel table yeah, uh, yeah. that you can buy with like a massive sink that you can buy like yeah. secondhand. I've got a secondhand on like They're hard to get hold of. I see I see them every now and then, and then. And then I think, where am I going to put that in my rental so my wife doesn't stab yeah. me? <laughs> um, but I've I've had my eye on one for a while. It's that that's so handy. At the moment, I use like a glass outdoor table, and um, it's kind of like uh, two meters by two meters square. Yeah. And I can tilt it on the grass and use my hose to sort of awkwardly 
um, clean off scales and stuff. But yeah. you don't want fresh water on your on your fish anyway. But like um, cleaning up the mess afterwards is more the point. And um, exactly, yeah, yeah. So uh, have you got like a? Is there like some? I know there's some awesome Japanese like YouTube channels and stuff that we're like. Um, they show you yeah, how they break down these tuna. Are yeah, they helpful? breaking down a tuna is 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 relatively like it's relatively easy. You think of a tuna as a as a round barrel, and there's there's four quarters on it. Yeah, there's two top loins, so you could like that that run along the top. The lateral line. Center. So you're cutting yeah, down. It goes hundred percent. So they go down the lateral line. Yeah. So what you can do is obviously if you've got a fish on its side, you can get the knife, and I normally make an incision. High up in the head, like really top to the top forehead, and yep. then uh, like along the gill line um, and down. You really want to like try and get as much of the meat as possible because all that uh, around the gills um, and the belly section is phenomenal eating. Yeah, so yeah. you want to try and get as much of that as possible. So you, you make that cut line high up on the head, come along uh, just down from the pectoral up back up towards the front end of the gills. And then you can obviously cut down into the, the stomach cavity. And then you want to cut down on the, the center line, like on the lateral line. Yeah. And you can make one, one incision all the way down to the tail and, and keep it as straight as possible. You, you might be lucky enough to, to hit the backbone and you just follow that line down to the tail. Um, and then it's like a normal fillet. You can make that cut from the, uh, the, the, the outside of the fish and you're obviously trying to cut the skin. Now, the skin of a tuna is very... Um, Thick and the scales are really strong, so you'll you it'll blunt your knife really fast. Wow. Um, so it, that's just something again, like you wanna if you do the stuff, you wanna have the right gear, like you wanna have a like a relatively big fillet knife because uh you wanna be able to cut through the stuff. Um I've seen some really nice there's this knife I don't have one of them, but I've been eyeing it out for a while. It's, um Dexter, which is like they've got one that's it's like a fillet knife, but it's semi serrated. Yeah. So it can cut through that skin a, a, a little bit easier. Okay. Um, but is that, a, sing, is that skin, a single bevel blade? Is yeah. It? Oh no, 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 no. That's it's a yeah, it's it's a dual blade. Uh, so the double bevel, the single, the single bevel, as I understand, is flat on one side. For, yeah, it's it's good for sashimi. So you're yeah. like you're that kind of like Japanese style. Yeah, yeah. When exactly. you're when you're doing that single cut. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you get uh, you know right hand and left handed. No, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. For that. Yeah. Um, they're amazing. They, they geek out on it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Noob Spiro's so, got a knife pack. It's currently out of stock, but I, I, I ran it for um, I ran it for the Kickstarter, the 99 Spiro recipes, and I've got- um, Those look amazing, yeah. Yeah, they've got the victory knives. So I've got a short sort of seven-inch boning knife and then an 11-inch one, and they're a bit more rigid than your typical tackle store filleting knives. Because I, yeah. I don't actually agree with having them super flexy unless you're filleting like whiting and, you know, silly stuff. Well, not, not silly, like tasty, but small fish like that. And yeah. I, you can do it with a more rigid boning style knife anyway. Would, that, would, would yeah. they do for the tuna, like the, the larger? 100%. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, something larger that's that's a bit more rigid that you've got a bit more control on Yep. Uh, is, is always going to work better. So then once you've got that, that loin off, You've got to decide how are you going to transport it home, or if you are at home, um, how are you going to store it? Now, the big thing that I've only learned this over the last couple of years, uh, and a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, James, he's he's really perfected it. So he's he's actually bought a fridge that he's drilled holes into the the, the top part of the fridge. So this is a single standalone fridge. Yeah. And he's got hooks in the in the the ceiling of the fridge that he hangs his tuna in. Yeah. So he'll hang. He won't even. He won't even process the fish. He'll come straight home, hook it up into the fridge, close the door, and the but, tuna will stay there for six, seven days. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before he'll even touch it. That's um, a be- I, beautiful dry aging. A, a bit like like you. Yeah. Exactly. That's it's that's the best way. Yeah. Now I I don't have the luxury of the second fridge, um, and I don't think my wife will like. That. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, fridge that's dedicated to hanging dead fish in it but yeah. um, so what I do is I'll obviously cut the fish I'll leave the skin on on that loin um, the way that I age my tuna is I'll take a big baking tray yep. and you know those drying racks those little uh, it's like a little stainless steel almost yeah, looks like a, from a an grid oven. for 
Yeah, exactly. Yep. Stainless steel grid. You uh, you can place those inside your drying racks, and when you put this, uh, the 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 tuna fillet in there, you put it skin down onto that. So what yep. happens is it can aerate properly, and if there's any moisture uh, that's going to be uh, running off that fillet, it's not sitting in its own moisture. Yeah. Yep. And and then I don't cover it. Like I, I might put one little piece of glad wrap over it, but it there's still plenty. It, it's still relatively open, so it can still aerate really yeah, well. Yeah. And you'll find I've had tuna in my fridge like that for I think eight. Well, by by eight nine days, I'm uh, everything's eaten. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, but yeah, I've had it for at least eight days like that. And so again. I, I won't – if I get a tuna today, I won't eat it – I'll wait at least 48 hours before I'll, I'll, I'll eat it. A lot of people think uh, fresher is better. Um, what, what we found was that with tuna, in that first 24-hour period, that the meat can be quite uh, almost jellyish. Yeah. And you'll see when you cut it, like it, it, it blunts your knife like crazy, but it's, it's, it's quite bouncy. Yep. Um, as you cut it and as you, the, the texture of it, uh, now you can cook it like that. That's probably no worries. But if you want to have it as sashimi, um, the best I've, uh, results I've had is the longer you let it uh, just sit in your fridge, the better. Obviously, yeah. the, there's the, the outside of the fillet's going to get a little bit tacky. Yep. Um, so you're going to have a little bit of um, loss of fish as you, you know, you're going to cut your steaks or the portions that you're going to have for that night. And then you'll have to trim the, the outer drier edges before you can actually start processing that and cutting it into, you know, whatever you're going to have, sashimi or um, steaks or I'm getting hungry. Yeah, all sorts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mate, I love tuna, eh? but it, it's just an animal you got to treat right. I think it's like one of those ones where you almost have to dry age it. And I think cook, oh, yeah. cook, cooking 100%. it, it lends so well to raw fish dishes. Like it, almost cooking it would be – Sometimes just sacrilege, I think. You're better well, off. I don't know, man. I, I've recently, again, um, I love looking at different recipes. Mm. Um, you got a, in fact, James. You've James got a couple of cracker ones book. and 99 spare recipes. That's a good book. Yeah. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, that's a good book to get. Oh, <laughs> only if you don't know what you're doing. Is that right? <laughs> There's heaps <laughs> no, of no, people. Actually, for. I've given that book to uh, my family as uh, Christmas presents, and um, I've used it already. Yeah, cool. Uh, you anyway, know, yeah, sorry, it's Andrew, really I, well. I, I had to d- no. get a self promo slot in there. Sorry. Of course, of course. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, the, uh, James, a good friend of ours, he, um, he made the tuna for me once, where he made just uh, teriyaki sauce. Yeah. Um, now the best for me was the belly because that's got a high fat content, so you can really sear it, and you get this caramelize caramelization of the of the teriyaki sauce on the pan. Yeah. Um, and what what I've started doing was you'd cook up um, rice in, in coconut milk. Mm. So you got this like coconut rice. And then there's this kind of like a rice sprinkle. It's got sesame seeds. It's ah, got yeah, – yeah, um, yeah. It's a Japanese uh, thing again. Seaweed. Yeah. It's, uh, I, know I don't the know one. what the name is. It's like I, distilled I it, umami. Yeah. I bought it at Woolies, uh, Woolworths, um, and it's phenomenal on the rice. Like it, And mm. then you just do some Asian greens with it, and it's like – Man, you could eat mountain loads of the stuff. Oh, so, yeah. so that that cook to me was uh, it's almost one of my favorites. But I think maybe because I've had so much sashimi that you know now it's that's that's a bit more of a, a newer way to have yeah. it. Like I think if you have if you have something one way too right. long, yeah, you yeah. kind of get a little bit over it. And that's the idea. That's the idea of the cookbook. It's like you know a lot of spiros. We've got these two or three go-to recipes and we get really good at them. Everyone knows us yeah. for them and we love doing it. But then you do it over and over and over again and it's like, i got to get out of this. I've got to do something that I'm not competent at yet, but like yeah. I want to, you know, you got to get that experimental mindset going again. And sometimes when you come home from a long day sparing, the last thing you've got is an experimental mindset. You've got like a, all right, fish yeah. tacos, guys. Um, you know, <laughs> but, but, but it's good when you have those days and like yeah. with tuna because it's sitting in your fridge and you – you pull it out on day five of dry aging. You've got half an hour to to um, to yeah. spend on thinking about what you want to do and what you. Well, want you've to- got a couple of days to to think about how you're going to cook it. Mm-hmm. The other thing is is it's a great fish to give to friends because it's very few people have had tuna like real tuna. Care for 
real tuna, not the stuff out of the can. Mm. Um, so it's it's something, you know, I've recommended even to people who are like, oh, you know, I'm not really like a, I don't like fishy fish. And I was like, well, I will cook it to you and you will think you're eating steak. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, this sounds, this sounds uh, a bit steak religious, but we've actually uh, um, uh, minced the tuna the other day and we had, uh, I had tuna m- mince. Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, if you closed your eyes and someone said you eat, you know, you're having pork mince, I would have been like, yeah, sure, I'm eating pork mince. Like it, it was ridiculous. I, I couldn't oh, believe, yeah. um, you know, like the, the the taste and the flavor from it and the texture. Like, yeah, it was really weird. It was, it was um, pretty amazing, actually. Do you follow um, Tazzy Adventure Man on Instagram? No. Chris no. Chris Bacon's his name, I think. I think that's how he's sat. He's got a mad YouTube channel as well. He's a super yeah. cool dude, and he's actually he's been doing this for a while now, and he, his authentic self is really starting to bubble through. But anyway, the reason I bring it up is because he's got this uh, Southern Bluefin uh, on a recent post of his on Instagram, and uh, it's just these huge frames where all the cuts have been taken off the tuna, and he's just got these what's left of a 100-kilo fish pretty much, and he's got yeah. this super rugged outdoor smokehouse and he just fires this thing up and throws these frames in there. It's really casually done. Um, and then he opens that door like a day later and pulls out this tuna that's been smoking for, you know, a day. And it's just like you, you're just looking at it going, oh, some, <laughs> some fresh bakery bread with some, with some real butter and some of that on yeah. there. And you would just be like in, in seventh heaven, I think. Mouth-watering, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Check that out, Tazzy Adventure Man on, on Instagram. He's cool, man. And and, yeah. and and then it means you're using more of the fish too. You're really picking off everything that's left well, that's, over. I think that's like where you've, uh, you know, been such an encouragement in terms of the community. And like I've listened to, I, I'd probably say like 95% of all the podcasts is oh, wow. uh, a real kind of a push towards us appreciating the, the whole fish and not just, um, you know, we get our fillets and then we leave it. You know, now – you know, there's a big movement of obviously eating all aspects of the fish, whether it's the, like a lot of people used to throw the collar, like the, the, the oh, whole yeah. like color, color bone or like yeah. the head head area away. Um, you know, we're now, you know, I think, you know, you can see people, uh, you know, posting photos of them appreciating the entire fish, not just like one, one little fillet. And they're like, oh, cool. You know, the rest of the fish is, you know, floating in the bottom of the ocean somewhere. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Love it. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough, just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Did you know when coming up from a spearfishing dive, it's possible that you would feel 100% fine right until the moment you blacked out? Did you know being dehydrated or hungover increases your risk of having a blackout? Did you know I have never seen a person hit the surface and yell, Tad, help, I'm about to black out, come save me. No, they typically hit the surface, take a couple breaths, and then quietly sink into the abyss. Whether they live or die is 100% dependent on if you are close enough to grab them and take care of the situation. Did you know it's very easy to have a loss of motor control or a minor blackout and not even know that you had one? Did you know that if you have a loss of motor control or blackout and you continue diving that day, you are way more likely to have a much worse blackout? 
Did you know breathing across the eyes of a blackout diver can help initiate a breathing response? That was 60 seconds with me. What else don't you know? My name is Ted Hardy, the founder of Immersion Freediving, and I want to do more to stop the needless fatalities from shallow water blackout than any other person on the planet. And that's why I created freedivingsafety.com. Lucky for you, I made it very easy to get up to speed. You can learn how to reduce your risk of having a blackout, how to save your buddy's life, how to tell if you're wearing too much weight, and avoid breathing techniques that drastically increase your risk of having a blackout, and it's all for free. Go to freedivingsafety.com and sign up for my free safety course. Dive safe out there. It's not even that hard, especially when you learn for free at freedivingsafety.com. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with kill shots spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, Crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. I had a recent post on the Noob Spiro community on Facebook. Uh, one of the blokes um, started talking about dive watches. He was asking people for their recommendations. Um, as you know, I started teaching courses a while back, so I actually had to get a dive watch. It gave me... It gave me that excuse. An yeah, well, it gave me an excuse to finally go out and bite the bullet and buy one because previous to that, I, I've been spear, you know, spearfishing 10 years without one. And uh, yeah. they're not a necessity, so, but they are yeah, so what, a beautiful what, what tool. Did you, what, what did you get? Let's, let's, I let's got a Sunto that. D4F. Um, I wanted okay. – I, what I wanted and what I got were two different things. So, like, I really love – What loved, did you want? Well, I, Sam Wild, um, who's who's coming on the podcast, he's probably out before this interview. Actually, um, he did this like wicked review of a, of one of the Garmin. I think it was a Mark yep. One or the Mark Two. Mark One or the Mark Two, yeah. Yeah, and I was just like frothing over it. And then you look at the price tag, and you're like, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Can it make me coffee? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I ended up getting a Sunto D4F, and I, and I like it. It's good. It does everything I need, and it, it's um it's actually enriched my spearfishing experience. I'm kind of yeah. glad I didn't get it early on, though. To be honest, I'm glad I've got like a fair bit behind me before I went and got it. Because yeah, I think sometimes it can um it can give you some wrong ideas. Like you know, if you if you go yeah. diving and you're feeling great and you're like you're with awesome people and the water's clean and warm and you're like. Yeah, I'm busting it out. I'm in, you know, whatever. Let's just say it's 13 meters, right? And you're doing yeah. your 52-second dives in 13 meters, and you're just absolutely pumped. Then the next week you go out and you just feel like shit. And you try to dive to what you did last week on your dive watch, and I think it's a recipe for disaster. Um, yeah. So, yeah. like, there's a fair bit of wisdom that comes with using new tools, and I'm glad that I waited because I wasn't very wise. So I think so. I, I listened to um, the the podcast you did with um, Adam Sellers um, yeah. just this last week, and uh, you know, like we've been, I've been running courses with Adam for for years now, mm -hmm. um, and I actually give a very similar advice. What what can tend to happen is that that in your head you think, oh, but I'm 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 always a forty second diver, or, or I'm, a, I'm a one minute diver, or I'm a fifteen meter diver, whatever that thing is. Um, and you might be on a specific day, but that doesn't mean that you will be tomorrow or the next day. You know, you might be run down, or you might be fatigued. So it's one of those things where a dive watch can be really beneficial because in the in the day it can really help you. You can you can make sure that you're being safe. You can be more aware of your surface time, which is what I use mine predominantly, just really just for surface time. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, it can be unhelpful, but it it's, if you, the, the thing that I don't like to see, and I don't know if you've seen this a lot in courses for students that have got watches is that during the dive, they'll look at their dive watch. <laughs> um you know, have you, have you seen some of that? Like, oh, I, I, I do it myself. Like, uh, I'll be down. <laughs> sometimes, like, I was down the other day and I was like, oh, this feels really deep. I was like, how deep am I? And I looked at my dive watch and I was like, oh, it feels deeper. <laughs> 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 but, but, yeah, guilty of doing it myself, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I just think it's, uh, you know, it can be unhelpful. Or like, it can be a little bit unsafe because if you think, oh, I've only been down here for, you know, 40 seconds or 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, yeah. I've got another 20 seconds in me. 
but your body is telling you to go, uh, you know, what should you listen to your watch or your body? Um, yeah. And so that it raises a bit of a conundrum for some people, I'd I'd say. But a dive watch is an amazing tool to have. Um, there's so many on the market, um, and there's I mean there's 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 different there's different ideologies that you that you can approach when you come to buying your equipment. And the thing for me is, um, my thought was I didn't want to spend on entry level there. What are they like three fifty four hundred yeah. starting Australian dollars? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's here in Australia. Like, obviously, uh, elsewhere in the world, they might be starting at different prices. But you know, three fifty would be a very good price for a, a computer. Normally, it's roughly around four hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Now, some of those at four hundred bucks, you're not going to wear as an everyday watch. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to spend four hundred dollars on something that I was only going to use once a week. Yeah, and so- you you want your watch to scream at people that you're a wicked freediver <laughs> Spiro, even when you're not. <laughs> Free diving on spear exactly. fishing. Yeah, yeah. You almost want so, the shape of a diver as the hand, you know, uh, like a <laughs> something like that. Or a fish. No, I'm around. just joking. I'm just joking. I'm here. I'm hearing what you're saying. So, so the the reason why I went for the watch that I did was I didn't mind spending a little bit more, but I was going to wear it as an everyday uh, a dive watch, and then I literally didn't, like all I need to do is put on a wetsuit and my watch is on my wrist already like I'm, it's not something that i'm going to forget at home yeah because what a lot of people do is they, they've got like a three four hundred dollar dive computer but it's too expensive to leave in a dive bag so they'll put it in their house so that when they go diving they forget it's at the house yeah. and not in the dive bag i did it the other so, way yeah yeah so I, I i prefer to have something that i can wear every day yeah. um now some things that's important for me is warranties is probably a good thing to kind of keep an eye on and i like personally I had the D4i years ago for for many years, and they're a great computer. Um, but they're expensive to change the batteries, mm. and it depends how frequently you're diving. They can really burn through batteries. I'm, I'm sure they're much better at it now. Uh, but I wanted to get a dive computer that I could change the 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 the, the battery myself. So. So the things that I was looking for in a dive computer was something that's got a longer um, warranty on it. And most most companies now in Australia, I think it's four years or five years. Oh, wow. Um, is a standard. I know that Sunto and Garmin have got two. Yep. Two years as warranty. But um, your Aqualung, which is the – what's the one that they do? The um, Eris F10 or what's – Ah, what's yep, it? yep. I think it's yeah the F10. Um, then there's the uh, the Cressy range. Oh, it's Oceanic F10. No, oh, the Oceanic F10. Yeah. Yeah. So Oceanic F10. Uh, all the Cressy watches. What are, what are the other ones? I'm I'm striking a blank. But most of the other ones are around. I, th- I believe around four or five years in terms of warranty. So they've just got a bit of a longer warranty. Mm. Um, and electronics and water always a good idea to have the longer. In, in my, in, at least for me, uh, the longer warranty helps. Um, um, but I'm I'm rocking a Cressy King, uh, ah, which yeah. is kind of like the Cressy Nepto, um, Nepto, Nepto but yeah. it's just it's just got a nicer bevel on it. Ah, so the so Nep- the looked- Nepto come in popular on the community. Like Eamon got on, and he mentioned like it automatically calculates triple your your uh, like your it triples your surface time automatically for you and gives you a countdown. Yes. Yes, I like that. Yeah, it is good. It is good, and you can you can set how conservative it how how conservative it is. Mm. So um, you can you can change the settings on it. So I've got mine set at three times. So um, so that I'm I'm always trying to be conscious of my surface interval. Um, but yeah, you can you can change a bunch of the settings on it, which is kind did, of helpful. Did you listen to the, my recent interview with the guys from Dive Bud? I hadn't got there yet. I was. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to catch up. I had a bit of a, a gap of, of listening, so I was. I got to um, uh, Adam's podcast, Adam uh, yeah. Sellers' podcast, uh, this last week. These guys have taken so, the same tech and just put yeah. it into something that attaches to your ear, and um, yeah. it's got a series of audible alarms that you program in, and so you, you don't even have anything to distract you on your wrist, and you can have yeah. as many or as few alarms as you like. Which I quite like, and their pricing was pretty affordable. I believe it's under four hundred bucks as well. Wow! And I'm not selling. Well, yeah, I'm not most, an affiliate, but like, like I, I was interested like a, in it. 
a, a lot of the free divers uh, that are doing their their own diving, they actually put their watch like yeah, the back yeah. of the Yeah, exactly. Um, so why wouldn't you just have a device that, that's automatically like that, you know? Yeah, makes sense. And they've got an app that pairs up with it. I think you can program all your alarms using the app and then it, it gives you a fair amount of data there as well. And, and then you don't even well, have only, the distraction the, of something to look at on your wrist. The only hard thing, though, is how would it be able to tell you depth after your dive? Yeah, so you can set depth alarms. So, it'll, you know, you could, and you could set what, how, how, that, how that happens too. So you might have a beep for 10 meters and you might have a beep, beep for 20 meters and you might have a beep, beep, beep for 30 minute, meters or whatever, oh, okay. whatever you're doing. So right. you can kind of configure them how you like. Which I yeah. quite, which I quite like, and I guess you could do the same thing with a triple surface interval. You could just have it go. Yeah, that's it. That's hard though because so I'll, I'll I'll tell you a quick little story. So when I moved to Melbourne, I went for a scallop dive with a bunch of scuba divers. Mm. Um, I didn't think it was going to be an issue until I jumped in and my first dive down. I got to you know seventeen, eighteen meters for Whoa. a scallop dive, which is D for scallops. Yeah, yeah. And, and I I just like flicked the sand and I was like, oh, I've got to go. I've got to go. I swam <laughs> back to the surface. Yeah. And I didn't realize how deep it was. And I looked at my dive computer. I'm like, oh, man, that's that's really deep. So instead of doing my three times surface interval, I went to four or five times my surface interval. Yep. Um, and immediately just changing my surface interval, I could then dive that 17, 18 meters and have stay down longer and actually get scallops. Where if you have a little system like that if you're in the, if you're in between your two alarms you're not going to be quite sure how deep you are or how to adapt and change it that's true too um, that is true too so that, that's a good point so i still like the the concept of being able to look at it and go oh okay well so the bottom is 17 meters um more informed for more informed yeah. and prescient information whereas yeah, and, 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 and then you can you can you can dynamically change things so you can yeah. be like okay well that dive i, I got to, to so like let's talk specifically like that dive it was 17 to 18 meters and I probably started out doing like a 40, 40 second dive. Uh, but by, by, by increasing my surface interval, I went from a 40 second dive to like a minute 20 dive. Yeah. Yeah. By, and comfortably yeah. by just simply increasing my surface interval, instead of doing three times, I was four or five times. So I was, I was on the surface for four or five minutes at a time. I like it. Um, yeah. So. So um, it, it can be a very good tool for for people to use to 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 dive better and safer. It's awesome, mate! I love it. Anything else with dive watches? I wanted to talk a bit um, more about your gear. The the one thing I'd say for for <laughs> for a lot of guys that have used their watches for a few years is check your strap. Um, a lot of the old straps fatigue and crack, um, and I've obviously heard of quite a few people that have lost their dive dive watches for that. So, so it's, it's something just to check, like everything else normally works really fine in terms of, you know, making sure your batteries uh, all sorted um, and things like that. But, you know, every now and then check your strap, like take your watch off and actually uh, stretch it out and make sure that there's no, if you see any hairline cracks on it, mm-hmm. you'll obviously know that, uh, that, that rubber or silicone or whatever composite they're using as for the strap is, is fatiguing. Mm-hmm. Something interesting. I don't know if you saw, I had a student on my course, the new I um, Apple Watch. Yeah, I've I've been actually I haven't seen him. I, I was interested to read any or hear any reviews. I saw a student had, had one of those, and it gives you all the like it gives you your uh, it won't give you your surface time, but it'll tell you the depth. Um, and I think ah. it's rated to forty meters. So so it's giving you shit it, information because <laughs> you need yeah. your surface interval. Yeah, so it's. I don't think anyone's done an app for it yet. Um, there oh, is a scuba diving app. Like it's relatively new in the market. So someone at some yeah, point will yeah. probably do it. Third, like the information. Third party software. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah the the information's there. Someone has just got to write, um, you know, make up an app to, to interpret that information and give it to you in a, in a usable format on your, on your iPhone. But you know, it's, it may be a good idea to be away from your, you know, notifications on uh, whatever on your uh, dive watch. It's simpler just to have, you know, numbers and uh, focus on, on enjoying the dive. When I think of high-performance sports, and I, I don't actually, like a lot of the time I don't think of spearfishing as a sport. I think of it as a lifestyle where I go out and get a feed and have a lot of fun. But there yeah. are there are a, a number of people that treat it as a high-performance sport. They 
they are always consciously improving very tiny things all the time. They're highly analytical and they want to get better. And they go to a lot of detail to do that. And I wonder where, where we're going to get to with it. Like in terms of like, you know, like you can, you can get online with a coach and we pull up your dive log, like the profile from a dive watch and it shows you all your surface interval, a bottom profile, mm-hmm. um, your rate of ascent, rate of descent, your, yeah. you, you know, all of that information alongside watching the video of it. And we look at your fin strokes and we look at, you know, your, your streamlining and, and, you know, you can give people like extremely um, detail oriented feedback on every aspect of their dive performance. And I wonder if we're ever going to get there. Um, I don't, it's not personally something that I want, but I can see yeah. there being, a, you know, even in our tiny um, niche sport, I can see a very small proportion of the people probably wanting that well i've done i've done one-on-one guided dives where that that's the focus of the dive so Mm. we we will go out in the bay and it might not necessarily be about getting a fish but i will watch the person do their duck dive watch them descend see where they position themselves on the reef yeah um and uh, and and how they look on that how they look on in terms of their positioning and and on the ascent like how Mm. they're coming up where, how are they holding the gun? Mm. What are they What are they doing when they're swimming down? How are they holding the gun when they're on the bottom? And then after that dive, we'll then process that and go, okay, well, let's try that exact same dive, mm. but let's do X, Y, and Z. Yep. Um, and that's one of the ways you can get like real tangible results mm. pretty quickly or be able to go like, okay, let's dive down together and let's see where I position myself, see where you position yourself. Or do you see what I'm doing in terms of, um, on the reef, like with my, like how low I am or how high, like, you know, uh, yeah. what are my fins doing when I'm at the bottom? What's my you know, profile? Are they waving like little fans or have I got them flat? Yeah. So yeah, yeah there's all those little things that you can work on in terms 100%. of a one-on-one uh, capacity, but those things it's, it's not that easy to do because, you know, like probably much like yourself, we've all got schedules and work and weather is temperamental and yeah, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, Tom Sandstrom sent me something, um, recently. It was a Joe Rogan podcast episode with this bow hunting guy. Uh, yeah. um, let me just, I'm trying to pull it up. Um, his yeah. name's, I think his name's Joel Turner, right? Uh, and there's a recent episode on, 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 um, Joe Rogan. He's a bow hunter and the episode, despite being about bow hunting and I'm not a bow hunter was extremely engaging. Like, and not just from the point of like the crossovers between bow hunting and spear fishing, but one of the concepts he introduced to me and I really got my thinking juices going was open and closed loop thinking, right? So mm. to give you a brief idea of what I understand of it, um, when a lot of people learn spear fishing, they do monkey see, monkey do, right? So you get thrown yeah. in the water with your mate and yeah, just watch what I do, you'll be right. And then you watch them and then you sort of, you know, you – you bugger up, you know, 2,500 duck dives before you start to get like an average duck dive. You know, your yeah, streamlining's yeah. terrible too until someone tells you, hey, tuck your head and don't look up until you, you know, you're near the bottom. You know, and, and you know, hey, your finning technique is like either super loose and wide and slow or it's, you know, or, or you're kicking from the knees or, you know, like all these like small things. And sometimes guys make small adjustments over time. And a lot of people don't. And, and when you start yeah. teaching courses, you realize like we're not teaching that, the same we're teaching people a closed loop process so it's like when you teach a duck dive you teach it in a staged fashion so the what are the six what are the six or even ten elements of a duck dive and we we work through each stage and we isolate in on that when we're giving people feedback yeah yeah and you can do this with any action in spearfishing but it forces people to get out of this unconscious intuitive style and into a more conscious form of spearfishing. And then after a while, when it's become routine, you re-enter back into a stage of unconsciousness again, but hopefully you've integrated that improvement into your your spearfishing. Yeah. I think that's something that uh, you've, you've touched on before those different phases of uh, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence. Yeah. 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 Well, this is similar. This is similar, but that's very close to that. Mm. Yeah. Related to that model. But I realized like so much of what I do, even in terms of my day to day job is done unconsciously. 
I'm not in the moment. I'm not isolating in on the different stages of progression. And therefore, I'm not really making improvements. I'm just going about whatever I'm doing without any form of mastery. And if you want to be average and shit at what you do, it's it's a fantastic way to do it. But if you like me and you want to improve and you and you want to get better at what you do, you you want to be excellent. And it, you know, like you, you have to break with that, become conscious of the process, isolate on the phase where you're failing, and make conscious improvements. Yeah. And then when that becomes that habitual, sad, yeah. you enter back into a stage of unconsciousness again. But yeah. I, I watch guys that are really good at spearfishing. And you know you're becoming average at spearfishing when you can go spearfishing with someone else and notice exactly how awesome they are. And you go, yeah. wow. And that's how you actually know you've reached a stage of progression. Well, you're not good, but you're able to yeah. recognize but it in others. See. And you can see the yeah. levels to it. Yeah, yeah. And that's where yeah. I feel like I am sometimes. Uh, well, which that's, is- it's, it's probably the best place to be. Like I think a lot of uh, things that you'll notice uh, as you're teaching your courses and you know, for myself too, when you're diving with people, you know, we, you know, like you're saying about a duck dive, you know, we can probably break a duck dive down to like, you know, 10 different components, mm. maybe even more. Yeah. Um, but most people just look at it as one thing. Um, but we need to go, okay, well, stop. Let's scratch that one thing off the table. Let's, let's break it apart into the different aspects. And hopefully over time, those 10 things become three. Mm. And then over a few more months of duck diving, those three things become two things. And then it becomes one fluid motion from your breathe up, final breath, you know, really fluid like duck dive in the water, mm. um, you know, into your finning technique. So it's, you know, sometimes we've got to break things apart to to, to build it back together and, and, and make it look, uh, not make it look good, but uh, – see some real improvements. I mean, there's aspects where I think we as Spiros could learn so much from the fishing community because the way that they can interpret and look at their sounders Mm. and find reef structure and fish um, is phenomenal compared to, you know, we'll just normally go, oh, let's just, this looks good on the sounder. Let's jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of going like, Let's 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 mark around. Let's see see where the fish where are the bait fish holding up. What's going on? If there's no fish here, okay, maybe send somebody down have a look. Are there any fish there? If there's nothing, well then the sounder's right. Maybe the settings are wrong on your sounder. Mm. Um, or if there's no fish, then you know don't don't spend all day waiting for a fish to come there. Go find the fish. Um, yeah, you're thinking about. A lot of it- Troubleshooting and 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 that ongoing iterative process, which everyday spearfishing should be, and it's just when you're around conscious, thoughtful people, that are continually like going, um, well, it's not just one thing. Like, okay, let's just take a step back. What are our options A, B, or C? And it, it's, yeah. it, it is a clever way to do it. This Joel Turner, just returning to shooting for a sec, and I've got friends that have, and we all go through phases of it where you you miss or you bugger up like three, four, five, 10, 25 shots in a row. And then you get this uh, over analysis of your shooting and it Mm -hmm. actually you're, you're shooting out of fear and no confidence. And it's a terrible way to try and shoot a fish because when everything's working right, you don't think about it. You're just in the moment, boom, boom, boom. But the problem with that is you're actually practicing this uh, open loop system, which is like you're unconsciously going about what you're doing. And so when something goes wrong, you're unable to diagnose where you're going wrong and what you're going wrong with because the whole process is just one thing to you. You haven't split it out into the six different parts that go into shooting a spear gun successfully. I really like this. One of the biggest things I got out of it was the self-talk. So he has a one-word trigger for each stage of the process. And then one other thing he does is he says, I'm going to up my presence. And it means Can like you, it forces. Just, hold on, yeah, go sorry. back to the the one the one word for each process. Like, what's what's the example? Do you, do you remember the example? So with his his um, bow shooting, because they're talking about specifically target shooting with archery, and his yeah. son is the current champion. Like, and he's very young, but he's grown up with this way of thinking about it. And his dad's an archery coach, but he's yeah. extremely consistent. A lot of the time with bow shooting, they. Um, the biggest problem is the flinch that comes with uh, your body um, interprets when the release is going to happen. So your body braces and that's what throws your accuracy out. So a lot of guys yeah. come up with these mechanical means of, um, of, 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 over, of overcoming that. And in spearfishing, we, we, we don't necessarily deal with exactly the same thing. It's not the same scenario. We're not as, 
we're not as precise with our process for a start. Uh, I, I do think that there's an element where we would um, compensate for the recall that we, we know is coming. Yeah. So that, I think yep. yeah, there is, there's, you know, some people and depending on like what guns you're, shoot, uh, you're, you're shooting, like so certain guns uh, will obviously have a bit more, like if you uh, have a, you know, big, a Canon tuner gun, it's going to have different recoil to like yeah. 90 centimeter with True. like a single 14 or band. So, so there's an element where you're, you're countering that, that, that recoil that you think is coming um, that might not come or now because you're countering for it, mm. your shot becomes you know less accurate. Yeah. You, 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 you just, what we do is a lot of the times we just shoot our gun a hundred times and then we know what it's going to do. But then yeah. something small changes and we're unable to adapt to it until we fire our gun another hundred times. And it's an incredibly slow, iterative process, which we hate. And it throws your yeah. confidence out in the short term and then we try to figure it. None of us ever go to a range and recite our things and it, it seldomly happens. And so a lot of us lose that confidence. And what we generally do is we go back to shooting like really easy fish for a while uh, until we just get that repetition <laughs> back through and we know what our gun's yeah. going to do. Um, yeah. and it's an open loop system and this, this guy, like by saying up your presence, instead of thinking about your insecurities or your lack of confidence with your shooting, it, it, it forces you into this moment. And then, you know, like you okay, bring my gun up, uh, align my elbow, um, you know, yeah. finger on trigger, you know, what, whatever your process is, but I haven't actually done it with my own process, but I was teaching my son to do a duck dive in the pool the other day. And I broke a yeah. duck dive down into five steps for him and it was one word prompts. And then we worked in on yeah. those, those single word prompts and he loved Great. it. And then he yeah. was able to recite to me a five word prompt for a good duck dive. And by the end of our session in the pool, he was doing a good duck dive. Amazing. Yeah. So I like, it was just something I've been thinking about. So if people want to listen to that episode, go to Joe Rogan, Joel Turner. It was a fantastic, it got me really thinking. So. Yeah. Well, I think there's so much that, that we can take from, from just that, just saying, you know what? How can we always improve as as a spear fisherman and woman? Like, how, how do we get better? Uh, what or what can we work on? There's 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 going to be aspects where you might have certain things really dialed down, and you know, there's some aspect of your diving that you know probably needs a bit more work. Yeah, um, yeah. And we're if if I think if you can, is it what's it? Uh, if you if you're aware of the fact that there's a deficit in skills or want to improve, uh, that's the first step in the right direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. You and you, you, you know, you, you know. There's that. I am the master of my own thing. You know, like some people don't really want to know about what they're where they're falling short. You know, there's a bit of ego bound up in it. Um, a lot of people are very conscious. Uh, a lot of people that, that um, want to improve force that level of that um, accountability from themselves, or they they demand a lot of themselves. They have high expectations. Um, and that, mm. these are the ones that are continuing to push. You know, like you talk to guys like uh, Tim McDonald and Bryson, and they just, their brains are, are level, super hey. computers and they run, they're running a hundred different queries all the time on how to improve yeah. different parts of their diving and Th hunting. That's why for me, like as somebody who wants to always improve my diving, I love listening to your podcast because you get some of these people that come on there and just, just seeing the way their brain works mm. and how they think about it, you're just going, man. I am, I'm like a hundred steps. Behind <laughs> I'm not even on the same page, let alone oh, the same book. I need a, I need a page, you know, start catching up. So it's good to listen to some of these guys that are, you know, elite athletes. Um, and, and you can immediately see where we can improve by just, just eavesdropping a little bit and just yeah. kind of seeing the processes in their brains just going man you know ah, like we yeah. we often put such an emphasis on oh your equipment you need oh you need you know these super high tech fins and you need oh this special gun and you know you listen to some somebody like this and i bet you if you gave them you know an average set of fins and an average gun they would they would they would outshoot you all day long Every yeah. day, and what? you just kind of go, okay, hang on, and, you know, it's it's uh, might not be the what's that, um, uh, what's the hunter or the bow, or you know, what's yeah, the yeah, Indian, yep. Indian or the bow, or a shit uh, tradesman always, you know, never, you know, what blames his tools, you know, yeah, it's the same yeah. thing, yeah, yeah. One of my greatest pleasures in life was I went back and my younger brother was doing um, these enticer or entry level triathlons, and I think yeah. I was uh. 120 something kilo and I bought myself a hundred dollar mountain bike and I was like, right, I'm going to have a crack. 
One of my greatest pleasures in life was was going past these three blokes on their three four thousand dollar bikes on my hundred dollar <laughs> mountain bike and just owning yeah. owning the shit out of them. Um, and I, and spearfishing can be the same, you know. Like when you yeah. you see some guys head out on a boat dive and you're shore diving, shoot better fish than them and bring it back. Like it's not like a super competitive thing, but it's just kind of like, hey, you know, like I was resourceful and I did the best with what I had, and I still got good results, you know. Yeah, that's it, man. <clears throat> like uh, you know what? At the end of the day, and that's why a lot of guys getting into the sport are are inverted commas lucky. Mm. They're just in the water more than than yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're putting in their thousand hours, uh, and they're like, oh, I'm lucky. It's like, no, you're not lucky. You've you've put in the time and the effort to get the results yeah. where some other people, they, they, you know, there'll be a lot of people that want to join spearfishing and they're like, Oh, you know, I'm, you know, I want to shoot a, like we spoke about bluefin tuna. I want to shoot a bluefin tuna, but they have, they're not going to put the time in. They're not going to put the effort in. They're not going to have the right equipment when the opportunity comes mm. and it's not going to happen for them. Yeah. So that's that thing of where like, you've got to, you've got to kind of like, commit and jump and do do those things put in the hours where you know the people that are putting in the hours um they're getting the results um in terms of the improvement in their diving the quality of their diving um, is that line fishing yeah. sale too? do the miles get the smiles or something like that <laughs> like there's heaps of these cliche sayings but some of them are like so no, you put in the work work and you know you you do those 20 days shore diving and muck and you take home like a couple of crap fish and when that day comes where you have 10 meter viz and the fish are on, like life yeah. is good and you oh, never have a sweeter, yeah. you never have a sweeter dive because you've earned it. You've, you've really yeah. truly earned it. And I, I think there's a thing about as you get older too, like you just appreciate stuff you've worked your ass off for. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and, and that's one reason why I love having you on the podcast. Here. You're one of those dudes that inspires me too. Like you're, you're a guy that's been pretty intentional with your with your lifestyle. Like you're a family man who loves spearfishing, and you've tried to design a lifestyle around you that supports your passion and your froth, and you're that's and it. you're doing it. It's cool. Yeah, thank you. The sweet, sweet sound of equalising on your way down a hunt of fish. It's not that sweet though. In fact. Most of the time we don't even notice those sounds until we review our GoPro footage. But sometimes though, a sticky eustachian tube, an uncomfortable forced EQ or ears that just won't clear can derail your dive day. Sounds like you might need Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Frenzel course, available at noobspero.com forward slash Ted. Equalize instantly and effortlessly using Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Frenzel. If you go through his EQ program and Ted doesn't teach you to Frenzel within 30 days, he will offer you a full refund. Make your EQ problems a thing of the past. Learn more at noobsparrow.com forward slash Ted and use the code noobsparrow to save some moolah. The Freediving Manual is a video manual that contains absolutely everything that I would teach on one of my freediving courses. Everything broken down video by video so you can effectively take a freediving course at home. The manual is perfect for any Spiro who wants to brush up on their freediving knowledge or get up to date with all the latest freediving safety and performance knowledge. Great news guys, Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code SPIRO, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one, there's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com Get Adam's course and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Hey, buddy. How's your breath hold going? Really? You struggling? I do too sometimes. And that's why I've got something perfect for you today. I think you'll agree with me when I say that maintaining or even increasing your breath hold is a struggle, especially when you're not slaying fish every week. But what if I told you there was a way to train yourself easily and do it safely. Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold, 
understand your body better and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program, free diving for spearfishers, is not for noobs. Uh, it's for people who have some diving under their belts and understand basic spearfishing safety. But it's perfect for spearos who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process and a set goal. The goal is a five minute static. And check it out, free diving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com. You can get started for free, do the taster, and if you do decide to purchase, use the code NOOBSPEARO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O, to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. So you've got you've got sort of three retreats going on that I can see at the moment that are sort of consistent, or they look like they're going to be consistent. And you and I yeah. are talking about adding a fourth one to your repertoire. Let's yeah, chat. Let's coming. chat. Let's chat about your three retreats. So you've got your monthly courses there in Melbourne. Uh, you, you're just getting people punching and doing that level one course, to, um, getting a feed of scallops, um, having a having a blast, and and getting yeah. in the water, getting amongst it, learning those baseline skills. Then you've got these three retreats. So um, we've talked about Killsby, so I don't feel like we need to revisit that. T- talk to me about this Wood Sundays retreat that you run. So the one thing that I, I mean, obviously I'm on a spearfishing podcast. I'm passionate about spearfishing. Um, I wanted to design something that's a little bit more geared towards getting people uh, into the sport. Um, because, I mean, as you know, like, mate, I think that was like, you know, your, your incentive to start, you know, Noob Spiro is the fact that there's people that want to join the sport, but they just don't know where to begin. They don't yeah. know how to begin. They don't know anything really. Um, so I wanted to have something uh, similar to where we have these, you know, free dive retreats and they're amazing because they're getting people into the sport. They're getting people into diving and, 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 and people are getting a lot from those, that, that format because it's a longer style format. You're not just, it's not just everything bang in a two day course. It's, it's over a longer uh, thing. So I wanted to design something that was similar, more geared towards spearfishing. So, so the one in the wet Sundays, we, we go sailing on a, um, a maxi yacht um so and it's geared towards beginner uh, uh spear fishermen and spear fisher women to get into the sport we talk about the equipment we talk about hunting techniques and things like that and it's you know on the last one that we did last year we had of the 16 students i, I think eight or 10 of them it was the first time that they'd pull like pulled a trigger on a spear oh. gun was on that trip there was a you know they shot their first fish there was one girl who her first fish was a Spanish mackerel, and uh, <laughs> uh, um, which is like ridiculous. I mean, uh, all of us were like, you know, we'd love to, you know, get that as our first fish. Yeah. So um, it was just I wanted to have something that's more geared towards, you know, my interests in terms of spearfishing, and yeah. and also have a, a create a space that's fun and enjoyable for people to get into. Because obviously we've got, you know, people come into this sport with a lot of concerns and trepidations and. I so wanted cl- to dive a, a, a nice place that's warm water, um, and you know where we where we get uh, fun. And it's not about it's it's not a you know these trips are not filling the esky kind of trips. These are let's go have fun, let's learn things, let's enjoy the experience, and we'll get fish. That's the the it's going to happen regardless. Uh, but that's when our goal isn't like let's fill eskies. Yeah, um, you know it's it's have fun, learn, um, and and we'll get some fish. There's something about being surrounded by like-minded people too like you're all on you know it's a type of holiday i mean it literally is a a retreat like you go in there to relax to hang out with cool people and do something maybe potentially a bit new and a bit a little bit outside of your comfort zone and it lends to this culture of like openness and just uh easy camaraderie and you don't even need to sink like 10 beers like you do after a day of work to have fun yeah, but it's it's those conversations that happen at the end of the day. Like, so we did this retreat last year, and just the conversations that came around after dinner at dark, and you know, someone would tell the story of like, oh, he was diving down, and there was this bummy and a fish, and you know, just the stories that would come out, and yeah, yeah. you know, some somebody's frustrations would be like, oh, this was happening, and I couldn't get close enough, and you know, it it was those kind of conversations was just so great to to share. Um, Everyone loves those. Conversations conversations like like the, the, the ones i did recently like the wa series where we're just sitting around a fire those are just, great those yeah those podcasts. And, and, and everyone wants that 
you know, like yeah. but the problem is when you start and you don't have a level of competence, you know, going out on those trips is, it seems unreachable but because a, like the experienced guys, they don't really want to take you because it's, it's not a hand holding session. Like a lot of the time, like a lot of these guys are going for their trip of the year. They really yeah. want to just have fun and get amongst it. And, but, but and what you've got to understand with some of those those people is like most of us, we've got very limited time to go diving. Yeah, to exactly. Find somebody who's very experienced to take you out. Uh, you know, he's he wants to have his own enjoyment and his own fun. Um, yeah, and, and not not to hold hands. Yeah, yeah. So that's is, that's kind of where courses and and retreats can help people like bridge that gap because yeah. you know you're you're paying for the opportunity to do it, but. You, commensurate with that is the level of support and teaching that you're going to get. And you're not going to yeah. get that when you're just out with your mates. Hey, you might still have a good time and you might learn. And a lot of people yeah. take to spearfishing like a duck to water. But let's be honest, a lot of people don't. Like there are some significant yeah. barriers to entry that, you you know, you have to learn how to overcome. Like we talked about just a duck dive before. You know, that's a yeah. that's a, a very small part of a of a quite a large complicated activity. And yet teaching yeah. it, we can break that one activity into ten different steps. And and sometimes people will discount how much you actually have to learn in order to be successful and shoot some fish. And yeah. um I th- I think that's where these retreats they bridge that happy gap. You know, you you know, people are coming with an intent, they're all stoked, frothing, um, a bit out of their comfort zone and and then that you know, you're 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 delivering something to them that, that helps them. I, I reckon it's awesome. Yeah. So that's a wit Sundays, but mm. uh, what Sundays? we let the cat, cat, cat out the bag a little bit. Oh, I wanted to talk. We, we can do that. I, I want to chat about the one you and I are planning, but I'm excited about your Africa one as well that you've got planned for 2024. Walk us through that because it sounds like yeah. something I want to do. Are you going to give me a FOC, like a, a free of charge uh. one? Oh, I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> I'm just so, joking. Yeah. Bro. I love putting Again, you on the spot like that, though. It was good. You looked so uncomfortable. I, I think for me is what I've what I've come to realize is I want I I need to lean into my strengths and the stuff that I enjoy because when I enjoy it, I have the most energy and I can give more of myself in those in that environment. So mm. we've obviously got like the spearfishing trip. We've got Killsby that I've been doing for for five years with Adam um, Sellers. Um, and now I just realized, you know, there's something incredibly unique about South Africa and I want to be able to offer that to people. Um, so I've designed this retreat where we, uh, we're going to South Africa, there's going to be some diving, but I've, I've also designed it in a way, um, because this is such a big trip. Um, I didn't want it to be like, so let's say Shrek, if you wanted to come, but your partner, you know, might not be a keen um, uh, diver or um, a, a swimmer, and sh- she might not want to be in the water. Um, I wanted to design a retreat where you could bring your non-diving partner along um, and and come along on it. Um, so what I've done is it's a you know flying to South Africa. Uh, we're going to Durban. There's about we're along the coast for about four nights, five days. Uh, this um, Obviously, the usual part of a you know free dive course. There's some theory. There's some pool stuff. There's a, a couple of ocean dives in there as well. But in the area, there's lots to do. So you know, if my my I'll be honest, my wife and kids are coming. They're going to be doing the like the local stuff in the area. There's some parks um, and game drives and stuff that you can do in the area. Go kayaking and all that stuff. So I've designed it in a way that that you can bring a non diving person with um once we're done with that the ocean side of things we're going to go to a private game reserve and we'll be there for three nights we'll be doing uh two safaris a day so one safari happens like every late afternoon and the next one's early morning so every day we'll be going out and you go out with like you know those open like safari uh cars you know looking at the game uh uh big fire like oh, big wow. five and all the you know, elephants and lions and all sorts. And it's uh, this kind of places, um, there are roads and then this, these are four by four vehicles. So if they, if their lions are behind a bush, you're going behind the bush. You're, you're, you're taking photos with your iPhone. Like you're not, you don't oh. have to have a massive camera with this massive zoom Tell lens, a photo to, like, lens. To, to get a, to get a photo, to get your, your photo of the animal. Like you're, you're oh, sitting wow. there with your iPhone going, click, click, click. Don't eat me. Awesome. So, 
I, I wanted to incorporate a bit of that into this uh, retreat, which, like, again, for me, I'm super excited about. Um, the next spot is uh, fly down to Cape Town, do a dive in the kelp forest, so like where they film the the My Octopus Teacher. Yeah, and yeah. that's actually where where I started out diving um, in the in the kelp forest of Cape Town. So we'll do at least one day there, and then then just explore Cape Town and, and the surrounding areas uh, for a few days because there's just so much to see along that beautiful, coastline. It's a beautiful and area. Lots of history. Yeah, yeah, like lots, beautiful. I heard there's 13 languages commonly spoken in Cape Town. Like uh, I had a, I've got a uh, couple of friends yeah. from there. Uh, well, not Cape Town, but South Africa, definitely. Uh, Seven in Cape Town, is K- it? Cape Town, there, there's look, there's Africa's got a lot of languages. South Africa's got a lot of languages going yeah. up, around in it, so it's uh, it's amazing. The culturally diverse, the food is amazing. Um, yeah, it's going to be a pretty unique experience. Mm. So, yeah, that'll happen in March 2024. Um, it's going to be relatively small, so we're only taking eight students on on this one, uh, with partners if they want to bring partners along. Um, and um, yeah, it should should be really interesting. So based based on our next year's one, we'll I'll start, I'm already trying to get ideas for you know the next couple of years where to oh. go and what to do. Hey, that sounds. But fun. I'm excited. I've, I'm actually doing a bit of an information, kind of how we're doing a bit of a, a, a chat via Zoom. I'm doing an info session this week, and I'll do another info, information session. So, if anyone right. is interested, they can obviously just reach out. So, salt and, sessions uh, on freediving, saltsessions.com.au. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, sweet. All good. Um, and then, like, yeah, I'm excited about talking about what you and me are sort of penciling out. Um, yeah, we're talking about running a trip on the Southern Great Barrier Reef um, on a charter, and hopefully having you know maybe fifteen or more students and uh, f- five instructors or, or or thereabouts, and then so this high touch point um, spearfishing course, which is five days of froth uh, and yeah. five different people to learn from, and the guides will sort of rotate around, and then it'll be it sounds a little bit like your Wood Sundays one where we're really trying to pe- put people in a place where they can uh, start to hunt fish and uh, really get some runs on the board. Uh, again, not, not an esky filling trip, but uh, although it would be great if everyone gets to take some fish home, that'd be cool. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the heart of, of this trip that myself and you've been kind of penciling out and, and, and kind of getting together and, and figuring it all out is to get people that are interested in the sport or people that are in the beginning stages of the sport. Uh, into a place where it's a good, safe environment to come along and have fun um, and to get uh, a good education side of things, to get some really good uh, experienced people to come share their, like we'll run workshops on rigging and um, hunting techniques and things like that. So it will be a really, I think, a really good environment to to get a lot from. Mm. Um, obviously get some good fish um, through the process um but i think just have a have a good trip is is probably the big thing and 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 have fun mm. um and in a in a really good environment i'd say is is the goal um we've we've obviously got a, we've we've chatted about a few little ideas mm. in terms of just having um uh, a little bit of a kind of a, a, a fun competition on the boat yep yep um i've always had an idea of 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 running a um uh like a target shooting um, kind of setting up a couple of targets where people can just kind of run through and go, okay, this target is you know out and open, and actually just go sit there and go lie on the bottom and see if you can actually hit a target with your spear gun. Yeah, that yeah. sounds cool, and it'd be funny if the uh, the guides and instructors got involved as well, and uh, we could all make fun of each other. It'd be great. Of course. Yeah, I love how, I love the local like a local bo- boat comp. You know, like you can have best trout, you can have uh, most meritorious. You know, you could have best wong. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of things we could do. You know, like um, yeah, it, you know the banter and the stories that happen, like you say at the the back end of the day. Like one oh. one of the charters I I really like is kind of like you, you know all your meals are provided, you have got hot showers and you know, you have meals prepared for you. It's fantastic. So you just focus on spearfishing, learning, and having a good time. You get up in the morning, have breakfast. Uh, I love having a, at least one coffee. And then you're in the boat by seven. You're out till lunchtime for your first session of the day. Come back in, maybe a quick hot shower, get out of your wetsuit, have some lunch, chuck your wetsuit back on, wet wetsuit, by the way, which is always lovely. 
and you're back Always in the good. boat heading out to a, a possibly a different spot with possibly a different crew and possibly a different guide. And, uh, yeah. and it, you know, getting those comp that you get that compound effect three, four days in the water. Like, um, mm. if you get three or four days in the water, just going spearfishing, you get a lot of runs on the board in that time and a very controlled and safe environment in a supportive environment too. It, it really yeah. allows you to gain a level of competence much faster than you would if you're just um, heading out with your mate and trying to do it yourself like I did. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, you know, for the listeners that are like something like that sounds appealing, um, you know, obviously reach out to Shrek and myself. Uh, yeah. We're still in the early stages. Um, obviously, trying to plan something like this, the 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 logistics behind it is not the simplest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's possibilities of it of it of it happening this year still. Um, yeah, my wife doesn't stab me because we got a new baby arriving. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. But mm-hmm. like, uh, definitely, 2024 is on the cards. We were looking yeah. at October 2023. Uh, it it's, could still potentially be a go, go to. We'll see how we go. Um, if if guys are interested, and we like, if I get if I get flooded with a bunch of inquiries, um, even if you're not quite in that learner group, and you're maybe even a little bit more advanced, but you'd love to come along for for the trip, um, hit me up Shrek at noobspirit.com. I'll add you to a specific um, list of people just for this trip. Um, Eckhart yep. and I would love to have you out. I've I've already got uh, at least a couple of guys that are super keen on coming to help out with instructing. Uh, really cool guys too, people that have been on the podcast. And so, I mean, we're going to, we're going to have fun when this thing does happen. Yeah. So yeah, just reach out to Shrek. Um, for those in Melbourne, you can also reach, reach out to myself uh, and we'll get you on the list. What's your, um, what's your email? Best email. So uh, info at saltsessions.com.au. Info at saltsessions.com.au. Sweet ass. So reach out to one of us and let us know if you have any ideas for charters or trips, guys, uh, even if it's in a different part of the world, um, we we this is Eckhart and I are super passionate about this. So there's yeah. nothing more that I like. It's exhausting work, but I tell you, it's so fun, man. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, if you've got ideas for us, hit me up, hit hit Eckhart up, and we'll um, you know, we'll add them if there's enough demand. We'll make it happen. We'll make it happen, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you, you, they will come. You, like part of the thing for me is like I'm running these monthly courses um, out on Strati at the moment with Kieran. And that's what is going to start happening every month from September. But for me, yeah. um, to go and run something with an experienced operator like you, uh, I know logistically um, we're going to have less hic- hiccups, and we're going to we're yeah. going to do our very best to put on an awesome time because you've done it for me when I was a student. So um, it's a, I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited. Yeah. So for for any of those that are interested, just reach out to us. Um, Strick, tell us a little bit about your uh, your monthly stuff that you're going to be running. Um, yeah, so Kieran and I have run two courses with eight students over on North Strati, and we, we call it like a weekend spearfishing course. Uh, the branding for it's terrible, by the way. Um, I ran one social media post. We sold out the first course in like 24 hours. Didn't even bother um, putting it up for the second one because I had too many people that missed out on doing it the first the time. First. So I wanted to do it the <laughs> second one. So it was cool. So we sold out these courses, you know, and um, um, I was able to take a family member on each um, and, and so that was really cool experience for me as well. And, uh, we've, we learned a hell of a lot, you know, um, are you camping there or no, nah, no, nah, we rent, we rent a couple of houses and, uh, yeah. you know, we've got everything. I've got a, a big box trailer. So we pretty much, you know, we nice. pick people, we pick people up when they arrive from the passenger ferry, shuttle them to the houses. Um, <clears throat> you know, we just, we run a lot of the workshops in one of the lounges and, uh, we cook seafood together every day uh cook all the meals together it's pretty much everyone recipes has recipes from the the noob spiro cookbook i'm assuming i'll be honest so we have not cooked one recipe <laughs> from the seafood cookbook i've just been cooking my go-to stuff i'm, um, I'm going to be cooking one of those recipes tonight actually what are you making um I, I had a good run on sweep this week and um in the cookbook i've got that uh, recipe on the on the uh scallop pies in the in the shells oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm actually yeah. going to use that recipe and uh put fish in it instead of replacing the uh the scallops for fish does sweet blend well to that um yes uh, look i i i'm i'm a massive fan of sweet uh yeah. very sustainable like you know the line fishermen can't catch them yeah and they taste amazing like they're my f- my family and my kids like favorite fish to eat so um yeah I, i'm a massive fan of getting them yeah. and they 
they, they eat really well, like a nice white flesh. Um, and you can do so much to it. Like I'm, a, I'm going to do that little uh, pie recipe tonight and then do some ceviche tomorrow. How do you do your ceviche? Um, man, I actually learned this recipe from the guys are, um, that I did the Wood Sundays uh, trip on. So obviously your normal citrus, so lime, lemon, and orange juice. Yep. Um, and then um, red onion, uh, a green apple, so your Granny Smith apple, like oh, a little wow. bit uh, bitter. Uh, that gives it a bit more crunch as well uh, with the onion, uh, coriander, and a little bit of vinegar, salt and pepper, obviously, um, and then pineapple, cut up pineapple to add a bit of sweetness to it. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think if I've gotten anything off there. I think that's… Sugar? Do you use palm sugar? Uh, the pineapple actually adds… Uh, I'll add a little bit, but it's really the, the pineapple that adds that, that kind of natural sweetness to it. um sounds way healthier than strike viche what's what's strike viche what's 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 that recipe i just use straight lime juice and then um kind of cut the fish up into sashimi bits let it sit in the fridge while that's happening i juice out all the limes um i use um spring onions and palm sugar a bit of fish sauce uh coriander passion fruit so the pulp, oh. everything from in a passion fruit, dump that in there. Okay. If I haven't got palm sugar, I use brown sugar. Um, and then I get my cheese supreme Doritos ready. And I oh. get and I get avocado ready, diced up. And then um pretty much I add the fish to that mix, throw it back in the fridge, give it three minutes, four minutes, or throw it in the freezer, get it chilled right back, and then um yeah. pull it out, throw the avocado in, and then um just with a teaspoon pulling out a, a, a bit of the brew and putting it on a Doritos Cheese oh, Supreme. Yeah. Even the kids love it. Like everyone's yeah. just frothing on it. My, That's good. My pregnant wife's like, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to eat it when I'm pregnant. And I'm just like, yeah, it's all right, babe. It's cooked by the lime juice. And so she's been yeah. smashing it even while she's been pregnant. So it's been great. Yeah. My wife ate a lot of uh, raw seafood. <laughs> <laughs> well, pregnant. But I think that stuff is look, again, I'm not a doctor, but you know, that stuff is you're more likely to get food poisoning from seafood that you're gonna buy from a shop. So yeah. but if it's fresh, it's you couldn't get better. This is the beauty about air fishing. Like we know exactly what we're serving up. Yeah. 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 So you might you might find if you use some orange juice in there, you might not need to use as much sugar. That's I think that's maybe why I don't use as much sugar, because I'm using orange juice and there's also the juice of I'll use a little bit of the juice from the pineapples in there as well before I, I drain a lot of the liquid off. The brown sugar just takes a little bit of that sharp tang out of it. But um, I yeah, hear what you're saying. Line. I actually don't like adding too much because I like a little bit of that bite, so particularly with the cheese, uh, you know, the contrasting flavor with the cheese Doritos. But, I like it. Uh, I like it. So well, I, might, I might give that a spin tomorrow. Oh, good, brother. Um, Eckhart. A pleasure chatting. Um, people can always find you salt underscore sessions underscore freediving on Instagram, your salt sessions.com.au. Mate, awesome to catch up again. Always a good time, mate. Always a good time. Hopefully we can get some people keen on doing this call, uh this uh this retreat, retreat. that we're organizing. So Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about that. You know, that's I think that's one area where uh, you know, we as a community can really I think uh get better in, in terms of education and helping helping people get into the sport in a, in a, in a fun way, in a, mm. in a way that you're going to have stories that you're going to be telling your mates about for months to come, you know? 100%. All good, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you. Hey, legends. Um, Jeepers. I'm, I, don't, I don't know what's going on with me. Massive interview today. I really enjoyed chatting with Eckhart. He's, uh, he's someone I call a mate these days. And uh, that African spearfishing for safari, get aboard that if you can. And if you're interested in doing a course with Eckhart and I, uh, in, uh, just email me, shrek at noobspiro.com. I will put your name on the list. We are planning to run a really cool spearfishing charter 
get out and shoot some reef species and hang out for the week. So, hey, next week, it's Nick Anastasia at Team Sea Monkeys on Instagram. This dude's cool, man. Uh, Jeepers, that was a really different chat. It's Hawaii um, chasing wahoo, blue water shore diving, whole bunch of madness. Really cool, scary story in this one too. And again, go to noobspero.com if you're interested in any of the Jobfish tribute merch uh, we, were, we were talking about. Um, they're a, a much-loved species in Hawaii. Um, man, they are such a cool fish to hunt, and that's what the Jobfish tribute's all about. So check that out. Hey, as well as uh, all this, patron legends continue to power this podcast on an episode-by-episode episode basis. You can go in and support the show for on an episode-by-episode episode basis for as little as $1 an episode. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. And, um, I mean, even if I release four episodes in a month, it's four bucks. Uh, but every single dollar is fuel in the Noob Spiro outboard. Massively appreciate it. Hey, guys, come back next week. Nick, Nick Anastas here, but today's guest... Eckhart Bankenstein, go follow that. Salt, Salt Sessions on uh, on the old IG and running fantastic courses down there in Melbourne. Cheap as I'm sport running this podcast, I'll tell you. Hey, thanks for listening today, legend. Are you looking for spearfishing gear in Australia? Head on down to your local Adreno Spearfishing Superstore today and explore their ginormous stores filled with mad gear and frothing staff. On top of a huge selection of high-quality Australia price matched guaranteed spearing kit and high quality expert Spiro staff. Adreno offer afterpay and a super easy returns policy. Adreno will have you geared up for your next spearing sesh with a massive smile. That's Adreno Spearfishing with stores located in Perth, Aspley, Woolongabba, Brisbane, the Gold Coast, Sydney, Melbourne. Get into it. Head in today or shop online at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200 online or even better, in-store. Your new spear gear is waiting for you. Are you US-based, looking for a freediving spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website is so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends and uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10, on your next order. Save 10% at neptonics.com. Mm-hmm.